Hi. Hi. Uh, <coughs> so, how many of you have worked with microservices? Lot. How many of you are planning to move to microservices? Almost everyone has yeah. heard about it, <laughs> right? So, a uh, lot has been you know, discussed about microservices as such, right? So, uh, but uh, the rationale began this talk, right? Why, why, how we should design microservices? Uh, let me give an example why that is needed. Let us say I want to do like a uh, uh, food ordering app. So, if I am making a food ordering app, uh, a developer or architect A will come in and say that, uh, okay, let us make uh, restaurants and menus a microservice and uh, let us just make orders another microservice and then let us uh, have a load balancer and distribute traffic, right. Uh, then the architect B will come in and say, no, no, let us make a restaurant a microservice and menu items are another microservice, right. And then the third person will come in and they will say, no, let us make each dish a microservice. Uh, paneer tikka will be a microservice, kadai paneer will be a microservice, things like that. So, you see the whole spectrum of people who are having different viewpoints of what is a microservice. So, this is uh, somewhat analogous to uh, normalization in DP that we do, right. Uh, so, you either you have uh, completely normalized tables or you have like a, a flat structure of this thing. So, uh, we will look at that uh, in this talk, right. Quickly about me, uh, I have primarily worked at startups and built uh, systems from scratch, right. And uh, I am interested in distributed computing and uh, building scalable systems. Um, and I purely enjoy coding in Python, previously enjoyed in C. So, that means I am very, very picky in what I want to do, right. Uh, the company I work for, uh, I work for Matsheet then. We have this retail brand called Vue.ai, uh, where we have this B2B products, uh, which are APIs which are hosted in uh, Amazon Web Services. And uh, these are uh, e-commerce companies or other brands who are consuming this uh, for machine learning or personalization widgets. So, we deploy machine learning models at scale. We are hosted on AWS and we serve like uh, 200 uh, MS sub latency requests, right. Uh, these are some of our uh, API numbers. We serve pretty huge uh, traffic because we are uh, amalgamating lot of uh, e-commerce traffic to us. Uh, this is very important because uh, the views case I do is something very similar to uh, what we do. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, again I am innovating, Microsoft is very well. So, they solve a lot of problems. What are the problems they solve? So, basically, essentially when you do a microservice, you are building a graph. You are building a graph where there are nodes and relationships. Nodes are each microservices. The, the relationships are what are the data flowing through the microservices and how they talk to each other. And once you build, start off with the graph of if you think of, think of your system as a graph, that graph will keep evolving over time. And if you do not have initial set of graph design right, then uh, the nodes become inflexible and you will not able to play around the pieces like Lego blocks that easily, right. So, let us go ahead and design them. Uh, I did a small exercise. So, I want to do this exercise, How, is there a, like a common literature to design microservices? So, I went to Google. I typed uh, how to design microservices. I took the la top uh, under 10 pages and this is the word cloud I got. This is a bunch of uh, generic terms thrown at us, right. So, uh, out of which two of the um, uh, keywords made lot of sense to me, data and database. So, essentially in engineering or software systems, we are only building uh, data systems that are either communicating some data somewhere are storing some data somewhere. You index in different ways, you query it in different ways, you send it via binary stream, you send it via JSON, it does not matter. It is data at the end of the day. So, if you keep data at the core of your microservices, let us see how the exercise comes in. So, as uh, you know, a follow up to that, uh, primarily wh what are the ways in which we store databases? Let us look at each of the ways we do that, right. Uh, at the top of the list, we have uh, OLTP or relational databases. These are like uh, standard use cases. If you do not know what database to use, you just use a relational database, right. And uh, the, you have multiple tables, you are doing joins across them. Um, you, you essentially use them for any web app kind of use cases, but they are bottleneck on uh, writes. You can only have a single write, they are not inherently distributed systems. That means that uh, you can, you, it does not scale horizontally and your master is right bottlenecked. Second, you have key value or document stores. These are eventually consistent systems which are horizontally scalable. Uh, that means that uh, you can store one, but you cannot do joins there. That means you can store a lot of data of one type 
and spread it across the system like uh, users in social media or tweets in uh, uh, Twitter, right? Then you have in-memory data store. Uh, these are data stores uh, like Redis or Memcache which primarily store their database in RAM. They don't store their database in disk and RAM and do the memory management for you. Where are they used? Wherever high performance is required, they use it because latency of a Redis is a single Redis call is less than 1 MS. That is uh, very low in compared to what uh, RDBMS or uh, Cassandra can give to you, right? Uh, these are essentially used as caches and uh, other queues which are needs to be low latency. Then you have the OLAP and columnar databases which are uh, used for analytical querying purposes where the same data which are stored as single table is split as columns and uh, stored across different machines so that your querying and your analytical queries are very fast. You have search indexes which are uh, inverted index of your data that is each uh, of the item in your data is tokenized and the term counts or frequencies of the entire data is counted and stored. You have object stores which are just flat files but you have this huge uh, infrastructure like S3 where you can throw any number of files at it and it will store it. This is a old array of uh, way you can organize your data and store it. Each of which has a different set of SLA and different set of promise it offers. So, we have to choose what kind of uh, data base that we have to use, right? And this is not exhaustive list, there are more add adding to it. So, let us take one use case, right? So, this is a uh, very simple use case which is image classification. So, given an image, classify whether, uh, classify a single attribute for me. The attribute that I have taken here, classify whether the person is wearing a full sleeve or off sleeve. How do we solve this problem? Uh, this is a use case, this is a business use case I want to solve. So, how do I solve this problem is, uh, I will I will have to build a neural network using computer vision. That means that I have to build, feed in a lot of images to the system and train a model and use that model to infer and serve results, right. If I have to build a like a simple architecture diagram for this use case, this is how it would be, right. So, like I told there is a set of image uh, data source which is passing through ingestion data pipeline which is a set of queues where someone uh, uh, like through a pipeline does image uh, classification modeling, pushes it to a model store and uh, there are a bunch of metadata that are associated with that images like which user has uploaded it, what are the, what is the title of the image and things like that. That goes into data query store. Uh, finally, when someone hits an API, it is a combination of which user served the image plus uh, how the model is tra trained, the model inference service uh, serves the request and uh, finally, the API is served. If you take the data, uh, how the data is flowing and stored, a data query store is like a multi object system, where you have uh, multiple uh, 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 models like uh, objects like users, uh, permissions and things like that, accounts. So, you essentially choose a RDBMS kind of system for it. If you take a model store, a single neural network image uh, takes some space between about uh, 200 MB to 1 gig or 2 gigs, depends on number of layers and architecture and things like that. So, you obviously cannot use any of the uh, RDBMS or uh, uh, key value system. You have to use something like uh, S3 which is a file store or a block storage like EBS or EFS, right. So, that store is very different and data ingestion is in a queue which is very different. So, this is the simple uh, use case diagram, right. We will take another use case. This use case is product recommendation. So, given an email product, recommend me some more products of the same uh, um, or similar uh, attributes, right. So, this is essentially a search problem. Here, uh, you see a person looking at a uh, shirt or a jacket and they are recommended something of the same color or similar attributes, right. So, uh, how this uh, use case is achieved is by again catalog and inventory data, right. What is the catalog or the uh, set of images that is in the catalog, someone has to know for it for them to search through it. So, it is a similar process where someone takes the inventory data and uh, extracts features out of it and puts to a feature search store, right. A feature uh, search operation is essentially a distance function operation. That means that you need a search index kind of store and not like a RDBMS kind of system. So, that is a search index. Data query store is similar to the use case which you saw before which is RDBMS. Then you have 
you can also use the events information like which product someone viewed what is the product that they bought and uh, things like that so if i have, if i already bought something that means that i will buy more of that uh, it gives us some signals so that is like a structured event stream that flows into the system and events data modeling is done and those models are stored right uh, a event store is like a number of tweets there will be like million hundreds of millions or uh, uh, of that data right so it makes sense to put that into a key value store you can also choose rdbms but if you want to choose, uh, scale horizontally uh, you can go for a key value store so that is a, like a different uh, system right so uh, this is the model architecture where again the api is uh, eating a uh, service and uh, it is going to a different search store there is a pipeline that is pushing data to different uh, stores and uh, the results are being served what we will do now is we will merge to the uh, like i want to build a platform i want to build a platform where uh, let's say the business will come like to uh, come up with uh, two three use cases right today like tomorrow those use cases will change so that means that my microservice graph cannot change with business use cases let's say they tomorrow they want to uh, come up with like a completely different use cases which is not image based and text based that means that there needs to be a microservice is supposed to text right so i want to build a platform so if i uh, you know compress this into a simple architecture diagram this is how it comes like right there is a bunch of data pipelines which is writing to a bunch of data stores which are actually um, purpose built like a search index is purpose built for search operations uh, rdbms is for a specific type of filter operations right uh, a key value is, is again a specific type of operations i cannot do aggregations on top of key value uh, then a set of uh, like um, pipeline services which uh, gets derived data out of those stores uh, then write it back again for example the features is a derived data it's not like coming as part of the incoming pipeline finally you have, uh, what you see in green here are those services which are uh, compute so you want to compute something at uh, run time and then uh, send back results so these are uh, like api facing service uh, services what you see at the below api aggregation is a composite service so you want a single endpoint where uh, when a bunch of requests comes in it uh, routes to different uh, um, services and it uh, microservices and finally like uh, assembles the results right but uh, it's okay i have now come up with this exercise of to analyze microservices i see that i can derive architecture diagrams based on data and uh, um, you know come up with this thematic uh, structure but will i put this in production no there are a bunch of questions that needs to be answered how to take this to production so this is an exercise we are doing from scratch to production so let's answer those questions that we want to answer to take it to production so uh this gives us a pattern actually so we see that uh, microservices are actually grouped by their functionality that they perform or the category that they fall into uh like a, uh, the green one you saw like is it like it's like a api compute service the yellow one is like a composite composition service and a gateway service you have two sets of pipeline services one pipeline service is a batch something you want to be processing um like uh, twice a day or thrice a day you want to use like a kafka kind of system you will use spark kind of system right so that essential software that is powering it's completely different a pipeline uh, which is a stream you will use a streaming uh, application right uh, so and then there are also data reader and microservices these data reader microservices what they do is that they shield the from users from misusing the database like uh, you want them to use it in a certain way if multiple microservices are Uh, directly accessing the data stores probably they won't uh, uh, use it in the most prudent way so uh, these are the classes that you identify and you then go into thinking how to how do they communicate with each other then there is uh, in real world when you deploy there is sla requirements there is latency throughput uh, those are some of the parameters that you want to support right so the essential thing that comes uh, uh, when we want to do support like a very high throughput latency is that uh your system has to have caching enabled that was not uh, there in our initial architecture that means that we need to have like a in memory system which acts as a cache and uh, that flows through the system right uh, and other other cases that let's say you are doing microservices chaining 
there is one microservice which is calling multiple microservices or microservice A is calling microservice B five times for each call. And if microservice B latency is let's say 10 MS and it bumps up by to 20 MS, that means that my service A's contract has gone by 50 MS, right? So this kind of uh, cascading effects uh, uh, will take place. So caching has to be handled each layer of microservice. So these are some of the considerations that we need to take into account. Then you need to take into account geographical regions. So if you are starting your business in North America and um, you put up your data center, you uh, take a cloud provider, provider of your choice and then you start, let's say start with AWS or GCP and then provision the endpoint there uh, and you suddenly get a customer from Singapore. Then uh, the uh, single basic op time from AWS uh, North America to uh, Singapore is one, one second. So you are, all your assumptions goes for a toss, right? Uh, your API get, went from 200 MS to 1.2 seconds, just like that. And that cannot be your basic platform design, right? Uh, what are the ways you can mitigate it? Let's say you are a read heavy company, you can use CDNs or uh, um, you can have region specific deployments, right? Or in some cases, you can have uh, some cases where uh, the data that is being sent uh, read by any part of the world should be the same and dynamic. You need to have globally distributed databases like what Google Spanner or some other system supports, right? So, logging and monitoring, I, I think all of us know that logging and monitoring is very important and we have also figured out ways using Elk and uh, to uh, use that, but we have really not figured out feedback loops, right? Uh, that is one thing which is missed out, right? Like when an alert is raised, how is it being closed? And what are failures? Defining that is very important based on your logging infrastructure. Uh, we, we spoke about one specific type of data, which is the data is stored in data source. We will move on to the others, other type of data, which is data which is being communicated between microservices, right? Uh, microservices needs to communicate with each other, right? And they need to communicate really fast. The operation of communication between them should be cheap. Uh, if you see here, uh, then it takes us to the conversation of service registry, right? Service registry is something where microservices register themselves saying, I'm here and you can send me any communication at this at this end point. Uh, so this is like a, a system, the feature that we can envision for a service registry. Um, at peak point, you can have like a, let's say 20 to 30 ser production servers running at any time, right? And you want, uh, I'm a big fan of feature flags, by the way, like any feature that uh, we do, uh, we want to like put feature flags and then push it out, right? So suddenly you have a feature that is turned off and you want to turn it on. Uh, if it takes, uh, the data needs to be communicated across. Uh, if it takes redeploying all the 20 services, then it's a system, system failure, right? It cannot be. So uh, if someone goes to service registry and changes the config for service, then it actually has to immediately flow into all the 20 instances and immediately switches that feature flag, right? So the other use case, uh, here could be, um, we just are thinking about config in terms of uh, each service managing their own config. But uh, service A can send config changes to another config. An example here is that, let's say service 2 has a feature flag called talk to cats. It can talk to cats and it's turned off. But for a specific user, uh, service 1 wants to enable that feature. So service 1 sends a message to service registry and service 2 updates its flag immediately at the runtime for that specific user, right? So uh, these are all ways in which um, communication could be made really cheap, right? So for this specific use case of how com um, microservices communicate each, each, with each other, we created this service uh, like our own uh, microservice registry called Wayne. So this is a simple uh, web app, right? And we had like a really four uh, very uh, small uh, design principles when we came up with the service. Um, like uh, there has to be secure config management for per client, per deployment and uh, per environment. Like uh, so we have like a globally distributed data center uh, operations. That means that this is like very essential that uh, this happens, right? 
and uh, I already spoke about the real time changes. The config push from one service to another needs to be like really cheap. It needs to be one MS, right? It cannot be like half an hour. Then I won't, as a developer, I would be like really reluctant to push changes. Uh, resilient notification system. If a microservice is down, that means that uh, the notification can never fail. And yeah, uh, a microservice can communicate its desired config changes to other service, right? That was another feature. So this is like a very simple uh, service we wrote. It's no uh, nothing fancy. It's just a PostgreSQL DB plus like a Python web app, where uh, uh, there is a service and it gets notified through uh, Lambda uh, through any of these channels. A service can register through SQS or ALB or EC2 server and uh, uh, it will get notified. So this is a very similar flow that I discussed uh, where uh, a config change comes in, each microservice is assigned a conf, uh, admin or API key through which it uh, sends its config change and the notification lambda does exponential decay. So even if uh, service is down, it will eventually get its uh, notification like it will ping at 2 seconds or 4 seconds or 8 seconds. So it, it has exponential decay. So thus, uh, if it uh, service is down for like uh, 1 minute, it does not matter, it'll, the notification will reach it. Uh, the way we have handled the uh, instant notification update is that uh, each server will have Redis running inside its machine, right? Redis being single threaded, it is very efficient where the config changes are not actually loaded into the uh, memory of the process. There are like 20 to 30 processes which are running uh, in each server, right? Uh, each process will actually read its config from the Redis, which is like a very low cost op. So the config will actually go and update the Redis and the server will instantaneously get the config changes, right? Very simple but very effective because all of this is powered because Redis is single threaded, right? There are no race conditions there. So uh, this is another flow where uh, uh, service uh, 1 is sending its uh, message to service 2. Uh, again, uh, this is the same flow just that depending on the channel, it will go and update service 2, right? Uh, Okay, so we have considered a bunch of observations that we want for our production infrastructure. It was latency, geography and uh, logging, things like that. So if I have to put like a single core platform architecture out of this, this would look something like this, right? You have a bunch of data pipelines, what are the new things here? There have a bunch of data pipelines which write to online data stores and there is like data lake or offline data stores. Uh, you have caching infra which is introduced new which will power your all your low latency API aggregation requests. So everything you see above the dotted line is a platform. Everything you see below that are apps or products that can be built on top of the platform. Since uh, every service, if, you, if every service is designed as per the function of it, the data that is handled, there is a very little chance that that service will have like a very uh, systemic change over the course of the product uh, roadmap. Right? So you can you can build multiple SaaS apps on top of it. In fact, that's what we actually did, right? Uh, so at the right, we we have the re service registry and discovery notification service, all the components that we discussed about, right? Which will you know uh, tie together all these pieces and create this one uh, infrastructure. Uh, let me quickly summarize the learnings that we did by all these exercises, right? Uh, it is the same question of normalization, right? How you want to normalize your microservice graph to the optimum level. And uh, at one end you have uh, brittle and another end you have rigid. You need to find the balance. Uh, don't have single point of failure. That means that uh, don't uh, have like a, a completely uh, decentralized system, right? You can have like considerable like uh, uh, multiple single points of failure, which are failures itself are like uh, less in impact. And master your data stores, right? Uh, because a, a single data store takes some time to master, and you have to respect it and carry along with your uh, architecture. For uh, the third learning for us is that every API needs to have a synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, API, right? Because you have batch operations, you have uh, every operation can take time, right? Uh, it, you can send results immediately or they can submit a batch and get it back uh, the thing. But if this is a paradigm that is 
uh, enforced across your microservices, it becomes very simple because uh, the developer is not coming back and saying, uh, oh, I need to introduce a asynchronous API for you. No, that needs that we felt that that needs to be like a um, you know mandated thing. And we spoke about real time feedback loops, like how do I actually mo have alarms so that it uh, uh, you know adds as input to my system building right and communication between microservices solving that on day one since especially since we are multi region and uh, multiple deployment kind of setup that uh, solved a lot of problems for us uh, finally uh, we also declared uh, microservices uh, as end of life right uh, you can uh, try to maintain a microservice till you think it has life otherwise you have to like let's say you have a spark based batch system and uh, you you have migrated all your systems to like uh, real time you don't want to like uh, really you know keep hanging on to the system just a example right so yeah so th that summarizes uh, the learnings that we have had and yeah questions Okay. What if the scalability has to be on a massive scale, right? Uh, if I, as you said, the one of the examples when we need to say put the whole config on a global level. So, any other example which uh, can you can say on this? Uh, so, so uh, we kind of containerized our scale limits, right? Uh, your app layer will scale uh, like horizontally. But then your DB layer will have its limits. So we benchmarked saying that uh, each read replica uh, will have uh, will support this much scale. So let's say if we anticipate it, we will add like three read replicas and things like that. Uh, what about security uh, related? So, yeah, <laughs> like the previous uh, uh, talk, uh, security uh, definitely was not the first focus when we started building it, right? Uh, security remained at a perimeter level, right? But then we st really started hardening our uh, AWS instances, like uh, having golden AMIs and uh, having it, uh, you know, um, you know, reduce the level of intrusion. So, we introduced IDEs and things like that. But in terms of uh, uh, security itself, from the data point of view, for all data stores, mandate encryption from first, right? For all communications in uh, HTTPS and uh, there is no like uh, non-encrypted communication that is happening. That was like the from, the, from microservice and uh, data layer that was the main thing, yeah. Uh, question here. Uh, you give an analogy of you no, know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but don't put one in each basket. Yeah, Can yeah. you talk more about that? I mean, how does it relate to microservices? Is it not too fine-grained microservices? Is that yeah? Like I said, like the example I gave, right? Where uh, uh, some some companies like Bosch, they have like 500 plus 600 microservices, but uh, at the scale of things, if you see uh, that decentralized uh, uh, things too much and. Uh, uh, basically, you need to have the workforce to support it. Like the actual ratio is that if you have like three to five, uh, four members per microservice, and uh, th there is a uh, maintenance uh, cadence to that team, and they have ownership and they maintain it over time, right? Uh, but the ownership falls flat at some point because uh, there is multiple code bases, and they eventually get merged into one, right? Um, uh, another example would be like uh, you really like uh, find over time, right? Uh, you have one uh, one service which is taking from a database and then giving it to something and doing a compute, right? You, we have all seen that. That is kind of really unnecessary because someone says this is I/O operation, that is a compute operation. You have to keep it separate. But that uh, distinction is kind of grey 
where uh, if you have the gut feeling like uh, the ownership of the team actually lies with one microservice, keep it one. Right. We do merge versus yeah, yeah, we, we do merge it, right? So it's the graph keeps keeps evolving. Uh, we we should try to make uh, the best graph initially, but they but evolving it shouldn't be difficult. That's the basic criteria, right? But if you get the database layer and the SLAs of that wrong, you have to co do complete migrations, which is like a different level of uh, evolution, right? Right. So uh, let's say you have like uh, uh, streams of data coming in. Like uh, which will scale to 300, 300 million, 300 million, 400 million, things like that, and you decide to put it in a RDPMS. Uh, eventually, you will have to move out of the system because uh, uh, you cannot like uh, scale out that system, right? If your choice of data store is wrong, you definitely will have to rewrite. Yeah. Uh, what are what is your recommendation for error handling in, in terms of uh, communication between microservices? Sorry, error handling between microservices communication. A is calling B and that is calling C and something went wrong in yes. C and like So that is uh, uh, mainly uh, one is uh, distributed tracing like uh, in the ingestion pipeline every uh, every incoming request is assigned a unique ID right. So first part is monitoring then the second is error handling. So monitoring we, uh, we, have, we have dashboards where we clearly see that the ingestion has not completed for this many products. Right? Because you have this unique ID, you take a, like a pivot on that ID, you will get that data on a dashboard. Right? Uh, second thing is you have fallback services, right? uh, which is uh, uh, service A is failing and uh, there is a lot of pressure because you are pushing even more traffic on the service, it creates a back pressure. So you have fallback services uh, or uh, fallback data stores. For example, we have uh, um, we have a RDBMS system which is a fallback for a solar system, but that is not the primary purpose of RDBMS, it is serving different function. In case that system starts failing, we route the traffic to uh, solar RDBMS. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So, some, some uh, some services are multi-tenant, uh, different services are multi-tenant in different ways. A single service uh, can process multiple clients data, right? That is like a typical SaaS kind of multi-tenants where you put all your clients in one DB and kind of thing. But some services cannot be handled like that. For example, if I am putting a solar cluster for uh, uh, one client which has like a huge data, uh, that uh, data set will be so huge that I have to spin up one more cluster for the another. Uh, thing. So, the uh, handling might be different for different customers there. So, the multi so uh, multi tenancy is not like a one uh, solution like say we either put all the clients in one uh, all the service like that or you have like different services where uh, it is different. Yeah. Can you go back to that architecture once? Uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, date for uh, so I I will I will like repeat what I said. Right. So, data pipeline we have uh, we have multiple uh, solutions for data pipeline. That, like I said, a data pipeline cannot be one. We have Spark based data pipeline. Uh, we have our own Inos data pipeline, which is based on Kinesis on uh, uh, AWS or SQS on AWS. So there are multiple data pipelines. In terms of data stores itself, um, essentially, if your data is scaling out a lot, you cannot keep adding them into uh, online stores. For example, a journal data. Uh, if I if this product was uh, uh, was this much price currently, is what uh, online data store will have. But offline system will have at this date uh, the price was this. At this date the price was this. So it will have like a time journal to data, which will scale very differently, right? You want, but you don't want to lose out on data. So you move all those data on offline data stores. The modeling service what is that is it needs a lot of data, basically yeah, for to generate features for machine learning and all that. It will look up use offline data store. Modeling services are basically bad jobs 
which will look up those data and generate models and put it across again to online data stores. Right? It will like transduce that and put it there. So the end services essentially will query only from online data source. Offline data source essentially acts, acts as input to the modeling source.